Signore e signori, buongiorno e benvenuti a questa Casa Italiana Zerili Marimò virtuale eh, per la presentazione dell'ultimo libro di Paolo Naso, and I'm going to switch to English now, Martin Luther King, Una Storia Americana. And you might have noticed that in the title of the event, we opted uh, to translate Americana into Italiana. So the, the it, version of the title of the event is Martin Luther King Jr., An Italian Story. Um, I'm delighted to have with us uh, three fantastic colleagues, and I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of one of them, Massimo Di Gioacchino, that will formally introduce uh, the other two speakers, the author of the book, Paolo Naso, uh, that I remember very fondly during his visit to the Casa Italiana a few years ago, and uh, Angelica Pesarini, a former at NYU of Florence, with, with whom we had this very successful series the past semester that she curated and really conceived with us and for us on uh, aspects related to the life and culture of uh, different minorities in Italy right now. And uh, I'm delighted that uh, Paolo accepted our invitation to present his book here at the Virtual Casa Italiana, and we hope to be able to have him back in person uh, very soon. Uh, welcome to all of you. As you know, the event is going to last approximately an hour. And in the last part of the event, you will have an opportunity to ask questions or make comments and remarks uh, according to the instructions that Massimo will give you. Please welcome uh, Massimo Di Gioacchino. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Um, hello, everyone. Buonasera a tutti. I'm delighted to welcome all of you connected today from so many different parts of the world to our panel discussion titled Martin Luther King, an Italian story. The panel discussion originates from the recent book by Paolo Naso, titled Martin Luther King, Una Storia Americana, published by La Terza in 2021, and aims to discuss the reception and debate in Italy on the intellectual figure and ideas of Martin Luther King Jr. from the early 1950s to the killing of Jerry Maslow in 1989. Before I introduce our guest, I would like to thank all the people that made today's event possible, especially the director of Casa Italiana, Stefano Albertini, Julie Canziani, uh, Julian Sachs, and Anne Wolf. I would also like to remind you that in the second part, there will be room for questions from the public. Paolo Naso is professor of political science at La Sapienza University of Rome, uh, where he started and coordinated the master's program in religions and intercultural mediation. Since 2016, he has served as coordinator of the Committee for the Italian Islam at the Italian Ministry of the Interior. And Naso has also taught at Wake Forest University and Davidson College in North Carolina and the United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities in Minnesota as visiting professor. Having grown up in the Valdensian Church, he keeps regular contacts with the American Valdensian Society, as well as some U.S. Uh, Protestant denominations. He directed the Mediterranean Hope Refugees and Migrant Program in Italy, which assisted refugees across the Mediterranean through humanitarian corridors. This program awarded in the past by the UNHCR of the United Nations. He is author of many volumes on religious pluralism, religious freedom, and American history, including God Bless America, The Religions of the Americans, The Other Martin Luther King, the Dream and the History, A City Upon a Hill, Puritan Tradition and Civil Rights Movement in the US. Angelica Pesarini recently took up the newly created position in race and cultural studies, race and diaspora and Italian studies at the University of Toronto. She earned her PhD in 2015 from the University of Leeds and has taught uh, courses in gender, race and sexuality at Lancaster University. From 2017 to 2021, she taught the course Black Italia at New York, New York University's Florence campus. Pesarini's work explores dynamics of race performativity with a focus on the direct intersection of race, gender, and citizenship in colonial and post-colonial Italy. And she's also interested in the racialization of the Italian political discourse on immigration. She has previously conducted research uh, on gender roles and the development of economic activities within some Roma communities in Italy and has analyzed strategies of survival, risks, and opportunities associated with male prostitution in Rome. 
active in the Italian anti-racist movement. Pesarini is the author of several publications on issues of race and racism in Italy, both in English and Italian, and is a member of the Black Mediterranean Collective, which re recently published the Black Mediterranean Bodies, Borders, and Citizenship, published by Pelgrave Macmillan in this very year, 2021. Thank you both for accepting Casa Italiana's invitation and being here today. Celebrated for, uh, celebrated for giving an exceptional rhetorical form to the American dream of equality and justice, Martin Luther King Jr. denounced with great force the nightmare of racism, becoming the spokesman for the largest nonviolent movement in American history. In contrast, not only with that White House, but also with some sectors of the African-American community, he sided against the war in Vietnam and advanced in increasingly increasingly radical criticism of the social and economic system of the United States of America over the years. Paolo Nauso's book rigorously reconstructs with a brilliant and vivid writing style, uh, King's action without hiding the in inner structure, weaknesses and progressive isolation of a leader who denounced the deep connections in American society between racism, social injustice and militarism. One of Nasso's main theses is that in Italy, King's political radicalism has, all, has long been overshadowed and replaced by a more comfortable figuration as an American icon and from a different perspective of a good man, a good leader. On the one hand, the Italian left did not consider um, King radical enough because, many thought, he did not emphasize class consciousness and did not repudiate the capitalist social order that the United States represented at the time. His being a Baptist pastor, moreover, did not appeal to many atheist and materialist members of the Italian left. On the other hand, Nasso argues, Italian liberal Catholics also did not recognize the radicality of his stances on poverty, war, and social inequality. In addition to invite Paolo Nasso to present the work behind his book and to develop, if possible, such theses, I would like to ask him what role the Italian publishing history had in creating such an understanding of King as a political figure. Moreover, how was King generally portrayed in Italy at the time? And lastly, why didn't his anti-militarist and late anti-capitalist stance, stances spread to Italian public opinion? Thank you so much. Thank you, Massimo, for this wonderful introduction. And uh, many, many thanks uh, to my colleagues of NYU, uh, Dr. Albertini and Dr. Pesarini, uh, it's really a big pleasure and honor to be back, even especially as the um, Casa Italiana. And I promise next time I will be in person, it will be a special pleasure for me to, to share with you in person. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity also to uh, explore uh, the Italian interpretation, historical interpretation of the Ministry of uh, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And as uh, uh, Massimo introduced, uh, I will start uh, from the so-called publishing industry. And we have to admit uh, that in Italy, we have a good uh, a series of publications by Martin Luther King. I can quote, of course, uh, The Strength to Love, that has been translated, uh, The Trumpet of Conscience, even uh, translate, and Where Do We Go From Here? translated. All the three books have been translated by the same published house, say, that is um, specialized in school books. Uh, so it is a very limited target. Nevertheless, the books circulated. But the problem is when these books have been published. Uh, Strength to Love has been published in 68. Uh, Trumpet of Conscience in the same year. And where uh, do we go from here in 1970? King was already dead. So the, uh, the, the fame and I would, I would say a, a deeper knowledge of the, of, of the leader, uh, of, of the reverend, of the, the person Martin Luther King arrived just only after his death. And... Um, also, another uh, book that uh, circulated a lot, probably 
the most popular book, uh, historical book uh, about Martin Luther King, uh, the one by Lerone Bennett, uh, What Manner of Man, published by the Protestant um, publishing house Claudiana, uh, appeared in 1969. So, before dying, uh, King was not uh, studied, was just uh, known as a person, as a leader, but uh, there was not the possibility even for the scholars to approach uh, the contents of his strategy. There was a, a very superficial approach according to the icon of the American hero, the nonviolent person who defeated the racism and so on. Um, I have to say that uh, um, this happened also for the most of the media. Um, uh, I, I researched a lot about uh, uh, the visit that King paid to uh, Paul the Sixth, Paul Paul the Sixth, in seventeenth uh, September of sixty-four. Okay, the news have been very limited. Uh, a Protestant minister visiting the Pope, no, not much more than that. There was not a, a real effort to uh, offer to the complexity of uh, Martin Luther King ministry and, and strategy. It was just a, a sort of a diplomatic visit by a spiritual and political leader to another spiritual leader, no more than that. So uh, in general, we can say that uh, um, the interpretation given to the Italian public by the media and the publishing um, industry has been very, very modest. Uh, I can try to uh, offer a three conclusion. Number one, uh, the Italian discovery of King started in 1968. Question, what would have happened if King would have not be killed? I doubt that he would have the same uh, attention, uh, the same consideration by the Italian public because there was a sense that uh, the American story was another story. The American story was an American story, was not an Italian story. Uh, second consideration, the image that was uh, portrayed by uh, the books that I've mentioned, even the one by Leron Bennett, uh, is a very conventional one, the very traditional one, very uh, quiet image of King, calming. Um, uh, the moderate, the Christian, um, the one who uh, repudiated violence. Um, so in this sense, uh, uh, even his, uh, his relation with other um, leaders of the civil rights movement uh, was not considered. Uh, it was used, so to say, in opposition to uh, Malcolm X and other uh, apparently more radical leaders. So there was not any effort to try to understand the complexity of the leaderships in the, in the civil rights movement. Uh, King was, for the Italian public, after his death, the American hero. And there was a process of heroification that happened after his death. Uh, third consideration. Racism was considered to be an American problem an American dilemma, if I can quote a very important uh, study. It's an American problem. It's not an Italian problem. I Italians are not racist. Racism is peculiarly American. Uh, it's a sort of um, uh, misunderstanding, intentional misunderstanding, because exactly the same year of, the Ma of Martin Luther King ministry, um, and the uh, strategy to, 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 to fight racism, exactly in those years, uh, the Italian migrants are moving from the very south to the north uh, to get a job in the north of Italy could not rent uh, homes because uh, the northern were not ready to rent homes to the southern. We don't rent to the southern. This was clearly written in, in, in hundreds, thousands of, uh, of images in Torino, in Milano, in Genova, in the 50s and in the 60s. 
So we experienced an Italian racism, but the idea was that the American story is another one. They have racism, we don't have racism. So we have a very conventional interpretation. And uh, to be honest, I want to mention two little exceptions. One is a TV interview that you can possibly um, see on the right play. I, I assume that you are familiar with the right play. You go to the uh, right play uh, website, it's very easy, and you can get a lot of Italian documentaries, movies, and whatever. There is an interview by one of the most important Italian um, journalists and producer of those years, Furio Colombo. It is an interview to Martin Luther King recorded on the plane in 1967. It's brilliant. Why? Number one, because that was a very difficult period for King. It was uh, the decline of his popularity. In those years, he was getting Martin Luther King because he lost the consensus of uh, an important constituency of the black community because he was shifting according to the interpretation for, from a typical struggle for the rights of the black people to a more comprehensive agenda, including the contrast and the opposition to the war in Vietnam. So what he is doing? He is losing the focus on the black issue and the black right. This was the interpretation, of course. Uh, the establishment, uh, the white establishment, uh, the White House uh, was strongly campaigning, campaigning against, against against King after he uh, clearly opposed to the war in Vietnam. Which kind of uh, gratitude had this man? Uh, I gave him the civil rights bill. This was the position of the White House, uh, Lyndon Johnson, and he is paying his. Um, is uh, returning to me a, a criticism, a so harsh and severe criticism against the war in Vietnam. So in these years, I have to say that Furio Colombo succeeded to record a wonderful interview in which uh, King uh, focused on uh, the Negro power, Negro power, very controversial concept. And again, I think this is a very important um, exception uh, it means that some Italian journalists, especially right in those years, had the skills and the capacity to offer a less conventional uh, portrait of uh, Dr. King. Another little exception I want to mention is uh, the publication of uh, a, 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 a crucial uh, text that is Beyond Vietnam, the speech that uh, Dr. King took um, at Riverside Church in New York in 1967, it was in the temple of white liberal Protestantism, and he um, had one of the most powerful speech uh, uh, against uh, the war in Vietnam. This text has been um, immediately published in Italian by La Locusta. I doubt that you know La Locusta Publishing House. It's, it's, it's just a little family enterprise, and at this point, it is closed. But uh, this uh, little publishing house had the, 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 the clear intention to and the, the clear capacity to understand that that speech was very, very important and very strategic. So due to this interpretation in Italy by Dr. King, what uh, did we lose? What we have lost in this uh, representation of uh, Dr. King's ministry? Number one, we lost the movement. Uh, the civil rights movement is not a movement, it is a, a Martin Luther King story. This is an incredible photographical mistake. It is intellectually uh, wrong, simply wrong. I think that it, it, to understand King and to put him in the right frame we have to remind the strong sentence, severe sentence by Hella Baker, uh, one of his uh, original assistants, who told uh, it is not Martin who created the movement, it was the movement who created Martin. So 
to say that Martin was part of the movement reduce his impact and the moral authority of the leaders? I don't think so. On the contrary. It was so important because um, he succeeded to keep a strong leadership being part of a movement and getting on also criticism from the movement. So this is something that we miss, number one, the, the movement. We miss also the complexity of those years. The uh, easy and comfortable representation, especially in Italy, where there is uh, the Kennedy mythology, is that uh, Martin Luther King and Kennedy and the Kennedys were wonderf wonderfully friends. There was a community of intention among the two leaders, the, 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 the Protestant uh, nonviolent leader and the Catholic progressive president. We know, we know from the document that this is not the real story. Uh, this is not what appears uh, uh, before the march uh, when King pronounced his famous discourse, I had a dream, August 28, because uh, the Kennedys, the clan Kennedy, didn't want the demonstration, the, the, the gathering to happen. It was too, uh, too critical for the White House to have such a representation. So there were so many efforts to mediate, to reduce the impact of that event. Okay, if we go to uh, erification of King as the only American hero, we miss also this complexity. Finally, if we go to a very conventional representation, the good man, the hero, the one who defeated racism, and so on, we uh, don't, uh, um, don't catch and we miss uh, the process of radicalization of Martin Luther King. Uh, sometimes there is the idea, especially in some uh, wrong historiography, uh, my personal opinion, that to show that one person as a logic continuity from his uh, uh, beginning to the very end, and he never deflected from a strategy, this is good. He has been always coherent. This is not the case of King. There are some turns, there are some changes, uh, and there is a process of radicalization. No doubt that uh, the Vietnam War and uh, um, the in it was very clear that the, the, the war changed the priority of the American society and of the uh, American system. Uh, the war became more important than the struggle to poverty. And if the struggle to, uh, against poverty was not a, a priority any longer, those who would have paid the major price would have been the black community. This was the logic of the King's radicalization, of King's analysis. And again, if we stay in a very stereotype uh, and relaxing interpretation of the leader, we uh, lose this complexity. So in this sense, I think that um, uh, Italy has not been different from uh, other historiography, the Italian historiography has not been different from other historiography. It has been, uh, even the states, very recent, a, a, a deeper interpretation of the complexity of Martin Luther King. The same happened in Italy, I would say, from the 90s. But it is very important that being more critical and also more um, uh, going in, in a deeper analysis of what have been the changes and the uh, radicalization of the leadership, we are not diminishing is the moral and and spiritual authority that uh, uh, remain a big pillar of the American and the world side of the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Paolo Naso. Um, I think the um, the your speech clearly um, points out to the fact that 
in order to understand the reception of Martin Luther King in Italy at the time, we should uh, give a look at the way the more general racial question in the United States at the time was perceived in Italy. And in, 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 in this aspect, you, you, you've uh, you highlighted a, a, a hole a, 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 in, a, in a lack of understanding in, uh, of the broader uh, African-American movement at the time. At this point, I would like to ask um, Angelica Pesarini um, how the racial question in the United States was understood in Italy at the time in order to um, follow uh, uh, our discourse, to continue our discourse. And I will specifically um, ask her, uh, did the Italian public opinion recognize the existence of a racial question in Italy? Or alternatively, were the, as, you, as Paolo Naso or alternatively as Paolo Naso was suggesting, were the evils of racism considered to be an exclusive American problem? And again, thank you so much, um, Angelica, for accepting our invitation today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Massimo and Casa, for hosting me again. It's really been among friends here, so I'm really happy to, to be able to take part to this conversation. And also wanted to um, uh, thank Paolo for this wonderful presentation and his wonderful uh, book that actually gives justice to the complexities of uh, this figure that uh, very often has been uh, polarized, I think. Uh, I wanted to start uh, uh, my brief intervention, maybe touching upon something that uh, Paolo mentioned when he talked about uh, uh, Italian racism. Uh, I think this is a very uh, key point uh, for, for many issues, uh, because it's true, uh, still today, when we talk about race and racism, uh, we always have this idea that everything, um, the US in a way is the source of every evil, while in Italy people are not racist, they are ignorant, but there's no racism because there is no race. We don't talk about race. Well, in reality, if we go back, and this is what I would like to do uh, now, um, is just to give a sort of historical contextualization of what we can call institutional racism. Because I think through the laws, we really can see uh, how uh, racism has been uh, dealt by or not dealt by the institutions, and how um, also racist acts have been um, not discussed. Because if we think about uh, racist murders. Well, we can go back to 1979 when Ahmed Ali Jama, a, a young uh, Somali man, a refugee, uh, arrived in Italy and uh, after a series of um, difficult uh, personal issues, he's, he found himself homeless in the streets and he's burnt alive in Rome uh, by uh, four young uh, white Italians while he was sleeping under a bridge. Not to mention Giacomo Valent in 1985 in Udine. He was a, a high school a student, 16 uh, years old, and he stabbed 63 times by uh, two um, fellow um, students who uh, were uh, extreme uh, right uh, uh, followers. So racism has not been invented uh, in 2018, as many thought. Uh, racism, has, racism has always been part of this uh, country because racism is a global phenomenon. Uh, and so it has evolved in different ways. That's why I think it's so important every time to um, compare, but also uh, distinguish the two histories and the case uh, of race in Italy and the US is really a perfect example. So um, uh, in the book, Paolo obviously tell us uh, what happens in a very short uh, period of time. So the uh, boycott um, in Montgomery starts in 1955, King dies in 1968, so is 13 years. And so how was Italy in that time? What happened in terms of race? Well, uh, it's strange to think that actually Italy was um, war ended in 1945. Italy is recovering, and the colonial past is actually not so past because 
1949, uh, when the British military administration ends, uh, Italian Somaliland is uh, become a United Nation um, trust ship. And so it's given to Italy. So Italy, uh, Somalia is under uh, Italian administration from 1950 to 1960. Um, and also uh, in terms of citizenship, uh, many uh, refugees, uh, many Eritrean, many Somali try to come to Italy. Some of these have uh, unknown Italian fathers, but also in this case, the law still um, follows some invisible color line divide. In fact, um, despite the abolition of the racist law in 1952, the post-war Italian governments did not grant any uh, right of citizenship to the children uh, and grandchildren of Italian colonizers. In fact, the post-war Republican governments uh, kept considering the juridical position of Italian East African applicants for citizenship as the same one as defined by the previous colonial fascist legislation in which whiteness actually played a key role. For these reasons, uh, Libyan, um, considered apparently closer culturally and physically uh, to Italians, were granted different rights in comparison to Ethiopian, Eritrean and Somali. And we're talking about 1952. Um, I mentioned how the laws are uh, perpetrate uh, racism. Um, and so, there is a uh, very important uh, racist uh, episode that kind of um, changes, uh, shook the waters a lot and started probably what can be considered the serious anti-racist movement in Italy. And this uh, happens with the death of uh, a South African man. Jerry Maslow. Uh, Jerry Maslow arrived in Italy in 1988 when the right of asylum, uh, although uh, recognized and guaranteed by uh, Article 10 of the Constitution, uh, was subject to the constraint of geographical reserve. In fact, with very few exceptions, only those coming from Eastern Europe were considered as political refugees. Uh, for all the others, there was not really a procedure in place. And so is interesting when Maslow arrived in Italy the Minister of Interior uh, received a, a, a message uh, that says that uh, this Af South African citizen has just arrived in Fiumicino Airport and it's not possible to uh, reembark him uh, immediately and send it back from where it was coming. It was coming from Lagos at the time, escaping South Africa, uh, because the, um, the commander of the, of, of the plane considered him a dangerous subject for safety on board. Uh, given that Maslow was in a very agitated uh, state. And so the, he's detained in uh, Fiumicino Airport for a few weeks. And when he's released, he's actually in this juridical limbo. And it's really interesting to see how um, in this situation, uh, trade unions and Catholic associations were really the unique the unique source of uh, help for migrants coming to Italy because we didn't have a proper legislation law. Um, at the time, there are um, studies tell us, research, research tell us on, only 10% of immigrants are legally registered in Italy, um, but there are protests. We can remember that in the summer of uh, 1989, there is a big demonstration in Rome for um, regularization of a foreign uh, laborer uh, and to ask for asylum rights and for better rights. In fact, uh, the uh, so-called red gold, uh, the picking tomatoes, becomes an, a huge uh, source of income, but it's very deregular. De, um, it's not uh, regularized. In fact, 
there are many um, um, criminal organizations um, trying to manage in that sector. And so uh, there is a lot of vulnerability and invisibility for the workers uh, who decide to uh, be temporary laborers picking tomatoes in the south. And so Maslow actually found themselves there. He goes to Villa Literno uh, picking uh, tomatoes when uh, he's uh, one night uh, is uh, robbed. Uh, his and his companions were attacked with guns, uh, robbed of their savings and eventually uh, killed. What is really uh, tragic, I think, is what um, Jerry Maslow said uh, a few months before his death. In fact, uh, um, and I would like to quote what he said in an interview, he said, I thought in Italy I would find a space to live, a civilization, a welcome that allow me to live in peace and cultivate the dream of a tomorrow without barriers or prejudice. Instead, I'm disappointed. Uh, being black, having black skin in this country is a limit to civilized coexistence. Uh, coexistence. Racism is here too, is made up of bullying, abuses, daily violences against people, who are asking for nothing more than solidarity and respect. Those of us in the third world are contributing to the development of your country. But it seems that this has no weight. And then he concludes by saying, sooner or later, one of us will be killed. And then we will realize that we exist. So I think this uh, premonition almost of his death uh, really uh, triggered a lot of emotion, especially when it was killed. In um, We have to remember uh, the entire nation went, uh, protested, and 300,000 people went in the streets. So it's considered as one of the biggest anti-racist march in the, in the Italian, uh, in the post-war Italian history. So what happened? This uh, murder actually uh, triggered a series of institutional and political changes. Uh, we have the first law uh, for immigration, the uh, Legge Martelli of 1990, that was designed when uh, there were approximately 50,000 foreigners entering Italy and 600,000 um, residents. Uh, so this is the first, we can say, formal immigration law um, because it finally treats immigration um, by narrowing uh, the flows and by giving uh, mm, preset numbers of access, by giving a uh, quota. So it links immigration to the job market. So although it's considered as a guaranteed law, in reality is framing immigration in a very specific way. It's true that uh, it, this law was given a, a permit of stay, which lasted two years and was renewable and can be obtained uh, for work, for studying and for medical care or family reunification. Um, those that get uh, in with regular documents but stay after the expiration of the permit were considered illegal immigrants. So we started to frame already to use some um, specific terminology that will become prominent uh, later on. And so illegal and illegal uh, immigrants are expelled. Um, expelled immigrants have 15 days to leave Italy, otherwise they will be deported by the police. And again, the aim of the law was to regularize immigration workers who were exploited uh, as irregular workers, but it didn't create a um, solid program for the future. So uh, another very important law is actually the one called Turco Napolitano. And it's interesting because uh, Livia Turco at the time was the minister. Uh, I was struck thinking about it. We had a minister for social solidarity, something that seems inconceivable in Italy today. So it's interesting also to compare the political uh, possibilities we had in the past that we don't have anymore in the future. And um, Giorgio Napolitano, who was minister um, for, of the interior at the time. 
So this law tried to further uh, regulate incoming flows and to discourage illegal immigration by establishing for the first time in Italy, in Italy um, temporary um, residence centers for immigrants uh, subjected to expulsion. So this law provided a permanent uh, residency permit, the so-called the Carta di Soggiorno, but also created a temporary uh, detention center for illegal and irregular uh, immigrants, something that will become really important later on. So these were um, places where structures, where people were accommodating, waiting to be deported. Uh, and... Um, who must be identified as asylum seekers. And then obviously we have really, we can see here how racist thoughts and politics mix together in the so-called Bossifini law. And we have to think who are the um, founders of this law. Gianfranco Fini was the leader of the uh, Movimento Sociale Italiano, uh, e Alleanza Nazionale later, uh, post-fascist parties. And then we have uh, Bossi. Bossi at the time is the leader, is the leader of Lega Nord, uh, that later on will become Lega, but at the time was Lega Nord, Northern League, a separatist party. And this law is still um, in force today. And that's why it, it, and it creates so many issues. Uh, what did it do? Basically, uh, naturalization uh, became longer. In fact, uh, it's at least three years. And especially asylum right principle were really um, turned upside down. Um, Detention center uh, were opened, as I mentioned before, this law, but this new law doubled the period of detention uh, and also immediate repatriation and criminalization uh, of, the, of the immigrants who uh, didn't leave Italy was emphasized. Um, before, with the Legge Martelli, we had quotas. Now, the system of sponsor, um, which alone guaranteed a right to enter, is abolished. And so foreign citizens uh, who want to come to Italy need to find employers uh, who hire them before coming to the, to the country. And so you uh, may understand how this is virtually very difficult. Another thing that was introduced by this law is the contract of residence. If you've been to Italy, you know how having a residency is essential, fundamental. Without a residency, you cannot do many things. And so this was also reinforced in this law. Um, but also, and we've seen this uh, in the past uh, few years, uh, introduced the use of official Navy ships to prevent and uh, combat illegal immigration. So the Navy can be used to send back uh, migrants. And finally, uh, to conclude this um, historical overlooking on uh, immigration and uh, racism, we have the um, Miniti Orlando, Miniti Orlando law that um, tried to simplify uh, expulsions uh, procedures to the creation of new centers, the permanent repatriation centers to hold irregular migrants uh, wanting to be sent back to their country of origin and also um, accelerate the management of asylum application requests. Uh, the, last, uh, the last chapter of this genealogy is the um, security decree uh, that was uh, established during uh, in 2018 by the uh, Salvini de Maio government. And we have seen a further, um, um, we see how uh, this link between racism and laws have been further um, emphasized. For example, citizenship, uh, citizenship applications, uh, the waiting time has been doubled and also the costs have been increased. So it seems that when we talk about immigration and Italy, uh, immigration is still treated as a majority security issue and citizenship laws that is transmitted by blood still perpetuates uh, racist and colonial um, conceptualizations about ideas of identity. And so uh, Jerry Maslow, uh, when um, is very um, 
in a way uh, interesting to think the situation of Jerry Maslow in 1989 and what's happening today in the uh, tomato fields. What has really changed? Maybe this is the question we should ask. Um, I'm going to stop here uh, because I know we want to uh, have Q&A and uh, we, I can carry on uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelica, for um, your presentation, for your speech. Um, first of all, I would like to, um, to remind you that uh, uh, below on your screen, you should be, you are able to um, pose questions to the speakers today. And so, uh, first of all, I would like to invite all the public, all, uh, all those of you who are um, um, joining us today to make your questions to Paolo Naso and Angelica Pesarini. We are going to start in a very few minutes. Um, we're going to start uh, the questions and answers uh, phase. So the second part of our presentation, of our uh, public uh, discussion today. And so um, as you start writing your questions to the speakers today, um, I would also love to share with, with all of you, you're going to find below the, uh, the link to the uh, to the book of Paolo Naso, Martin Luther King, Una Storia Americana. So uh, whoever is interested in knowing more about uh, the recent book published by La Terza this year, whoever is also interested uh, uh, to purchase the book, you have the link here in the chat. And so you are going to be able to get more information and eventually, um, if desired, also to buy the, the ebook. Um, it seems to me, and this is a, um, a, a remark, a reflection I would like to make um, uh, to both to Paolo Naso and to Angelica Pesarini, it seems that the way a king was portrayed in Italy at the time, again, uh, from 1955 to 1968, now Naso um, clearly stated that something changes uh, with his dad, but more in general, the way he was portrayed in Italy at the time is linked to the uh, to the lack of a public discourse on race in Italy, and, and this is also what um, Angelica was suggesting that only with the killing of Jerry Maslow in Italy in 1989, Italy somehow publicly discovers can't deny anymore that there is a racial question in Italy as well. And this is due to uh, the increasing presence during the 70s, 80s, and it's today Italy is clearly a different society if compared to 1950s, a, a, a increasing presence of different ethnic, religious, cultural communities. But so uh, I, it seems to me that one of the, the points that comes out from your both of your presentation is that the lack of a public discourse on race, an honest discourse on race at the time, uh, changes the perception of King. King is not considered, can't be considered radical because what he's, the content of his public political discourse is not really received. King is not radical because he does not pose any cultural threats of, to this status, racial status quo in Italy at the time, but as not only Angelica Pesarini was clearly mentioning before and after the killing of Jerry Maslow, but also as Paolo Naso was referring when he when he was speaking of the of the arrival of the Southerners in the industrial North, even during King's life and the racism they experienced. Um, again, we, the, we now know that. Uh, even though there wasn't a public discourse of race, a racial question at the time while King was uh, alive was there in Italian society. Uh, and so King, as, as both um, Nasso and Pesarini were suggesting, uh, King was radical. King was speaking to a, uh, a Western white society, um, but Italy decided, Italy um, uh, wanted to perceive King only as, and here, here is where we started today's panel discussion, Italy desired, uh, wanted and chose to, to see King as an American icon. 
a good man, a good leader, but not, not someone who could uh, uh, change the status quo in Italy. And so, um, again, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, receive and read and uh, pose to the speakers the questions that, uh, that all of you would like to pose them. So feel free to write here in the Q&A chat here below in Zoom. And while uh, we gather a few questions from the public, I would love um, Paolo Nasso to answer the subject, the, uh, the, the content of the speech of Angelica Pesserini and to make any responses to her very long, clear uh, um, discourse on racial policies and, ra and racist politics in Italy. And again, so I will, I will give, give the floor to Paolo Nasso, but in the meantime, we are going to gather a few questions. Thank you. Thank you, Massimo. I don't have much to add. But uh, just to specify that sometimes the racialization of the Italian discourse uh, about migrants goes through um, religious uh, guidelines. So it depends from the atmosphere. Sometimes the problems are the Moroccans. In other periods, they have been the Muslims. In other periods, they have been the fundamentalists. In other periods, they have the uh, refugees. In other periods, they have the, the North Africans. So um, it depends from uh, um, the situation, the context. At some times, the consideration does go through the origin of the people, but, uh, through their uh, religious belonging. And this is devastating, simply devastating. Number one, because it uh, uh, destroys the spirit of uh, uh, pluralism. Uh, Italy uh, has a, a clear destiny to, to become a pluralistic country, no, no ways. Um, even though there is a massive uh, a presence of the Catholic Church, all the research and statistics now show that uh, Catholics in Italy are a minority. I would say a consistent minority, let's say 30%, 25% of the Italian population, but uh, they are a minority. On the opposite, we have 10%, at least, of Italians who worship in a different way than the Catholic one. I think at least 6, 000, 6 millions of people. So Italy is changing, is changing. And the racism can go through um, other guidelines, not only the racial one. Uh, we have some problems in Europe, as you know, to adopt the category of race. We have a serious problem for that, for what happened in the 30s. Uh, but um, for sure, it is a process that sometimes includes also religious categories. And uh, there is a way to be racist without uh, um, naming race, but naming a, a religion. Um, what I would like to, to also to, uh, to add probably is that uh, the process, the political process says that Angelica uh, describe as being controversial in some ways. And uh, some stops became not only from the civil society, but also from the constitutional court. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the, Italian, uh, uh, the Italian ships are not authorized anymore to push back the migrants. This is very clear. It is against our policy and uh, against our constitution. So, uh, yes, of course, the, the, the law is still in power, but the application of the law according and thanks to the interpretation of the Constitutional Court changed and changed for better in this case. Uh, another example, the case of the NGOs who are forbidden to, to search and rescue in the Mediterranean. It is very clear that there is a massive campaign to criminalize any action of search and rescue in the Mediterranean. If they break the law, they have to die. This is the axiom that many people hate. But again, it is very clear that this is not the law. And now uh, any boat uh, who uh, uh, meets uh, um, uh, refugees in the sea has the uh, duty to, to act uh, in the direction of search and rescue. So um, there is a, 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 a controversy at least, and this is, very important. And there are also good practices. 
probably in Italy more than in other European countries. Uh, the experiment of the, of the humanitarian corridors started in Italy, and up to now, it is a very peculiar Italian experience. And I'm happy to say that. Thank you, Paolo Nasso. Um, while, um, An Angelica, you are uh, very welcome to um, take the floor whenever you want, I just want to share with you that there are at uh, this moment, there are two questions from the public. The first one from Jean Golden, and she, uh, he or she asks, what role does the Pope play in mitigating the racial problems in Italy? And so I guess today, and so it's it's a question about the role of, the, of Pope Francis and the papacy today in the racial uh, uh, discourse in Italy. Um, uh, and the second one from uh, Luciana Polni, uh, who asks, how are Italy's 1938 racial laws similar to Salvini's policies of 2018? So I would uh, kindly ask both Paolo and Angelica to, if they want to start to answer them, uh, as we are receiving, and, and, and if, if possible, to be very brief, because I see we are receiving more and more questions, and I know um, it's going to be great if you can answer as many as possible. And so, sure. Um, I can I can respond uh, Lucia's question, I think, just because I recently wrote a book chapter precisely on this. Uh, so uh, 2018 was a very peculiar year because it was the 80th anniversary of the racial laws, of the fascist racial laws. And 2018 was a year marked by uh, brutal episodes of racism. But something I would like to mention here to Lucia, and obviously we are in a very... Uh, um, in a complete different historical setting. So we cannot uh, compare the two uh, legislative um, periods, but we can see the legacies of the fascist and the regime and conceptualizations of race in from 1938 to 2018. And I would like to just mention an example. Uh, 2018 starts, we are in the middle of the electoral campaign. We will know that in June, uh, Salvini the Mayo government uh, take the lead. 15th of January 2018, uh, Attilio Fontana, uh, the current governor of Lombardia, at the time he was a candidate for Lega, he starts with a declaration at the beginning of the year. And he's about um, um, refugees and asylum seekers. He says, we cannot take them all because they are far, um, they outnumber us. And we cannot take them all because otherwise we will see the extinction of the white race. These are his words, la, la estinzione della razza bianca. So these words, razza bianca, were used, were at the core of the um, racist uh, and um, um, of the racial laws uh, with the Manifesto della Razza in 1938. So although we cannot compare the two periods, because as I said, it's a completely different historical setting, we can clearly see some legacies here. And it's quite striking to hear Razza Bianca being said on the 80th anniversary of the racial laws. I don't know if pa Paolo Naso wants to answer yeah. the, the other I, question. I, I, fully, I fully agree with Angelica, we can't compare. Uh, there is some legacy, but it's clear that the um, political context is totally different. We are not in a dictatorship, we are in democracy, and we have the possibility to react to this phenomenon. I mean, what are the uh, people, the NGOs, and many associations, and many the congregations, uh, not only Christian congregations, are doing for the migrants, it's totally legal, and it can it's doing the difference. And this gave me the uh, opportunity to say um, something about the Pope. Uh, um, I, I do believe the Pope is, is the most important moral voice we have in Italy at this moment uh, on migration policies. Is this a good news? No, not for me, but not because I am not a Catholic. It is not a good news because uh, I, I do believe that the Pope has another ministry. Uh, of course, he can uh, speak about moral conscience. He can preach as exactly as Martin Luther King did, but it's very clear that the absent voice in this public debate is the voice of the good politics. 
we have the case of the refugees. Uh, according to our constitution, that uh, what mentioned Article 10, we have the duty to grant in Italy to the refugees uh, the same right they are denied in their own country. This is very clear. It's a very strong statement in our constitution. It is not implemented. The migrants or the refugees are granted this uh, right if they risk their life crossing to the, the Mediterranean. If they cross the Mediterranean, if they are lucky, uh, lucky enough to survive, they can probably get uh, this right. But they have to run the risk before that. Um, so uh, in this sense, I think that uh, um, there is a lack of... Um, of the uh, a real incapacity of our political system, our parties, to interpret the needs of a dynamic society. Uh, we uh, underestimate the, what is happening in the Mediterranean and in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we uh, do believe, uh, a lot of people, and especially some parties, do believe the only, the only recipe is to close the border. This is the solution. This is a very short, a very short-term solution, and it is not realistic. Because even those who should be expelled can't be expelled because there are no agreements with the country who should get them back. So uh, you can say, okay, I send this person back to Tunisia. And the Tunisian government said, yes, we are ready to take uh, our refugees or migrants back, but slowly. We uh, are not ready to take 10,000 as the Italian government pretends. So everything is very much more complicated than some easy populistic propaganda pretends to say. So in this lack of the political discourse, the moral discourse of the Pope um, uh, gets uh, very, very important, becomes very, very important. Of course, uh, this is uh, um, very uh, meaningful, but at the same time, it expresses a crisis of the political dynamics that we have to take into serious consideration. Um, I see there is um, there is a question about the reception of the Black Panther Party in Italy, and um, Cristina Bellini from NYU Florence asked what was indeed the reception, and also um, Paolo Nasso uh, made a very precise reference to the translations of King at the time, the very few translations of King at the time, and Cristina Bellini asked if it was instead Malcolm X translated, and so. Uh, I I would uh, I guess Paolo Nasso can answer that. I don't know if Angelica has anything to say about that uh, too as well. This was one of my questions actually for Paolo because it was really interesting to hear more about the polarization of these figures. You know, also Malcolm X in Italy, uh, in, in Europe in general, I think is one of these figures that has been incredibly polarized. And uh, the reality is, is much more complex. In fact, at the end of the um, of his time, Malcolm X actually was in, in touch with Malcolm X and they were started to plan some uh, work together. So I think it's also my question along, as long with Christina, which I say hi to. Okay. Uh, when you think about the, the Italian audience in those years, you have to consider that it was very politically polarized. So you had some uh, neo-fascists, very conservative people. Uh, you have the Catholics, and you have the growing uh, leftist parties. Uh, uh, you are aware that in those years, uh, the Italian Communist Party was the strongest um, uh, Communist Party in the West. So uh, when we think about the Italian audience in the 60s, you have to think about the neo-fascists, the Catholic, and the communists, so to say. All of them, for different reasons, uh, were not in the position to understand Martin Luther King and American politics, because they were a food of prejudice uh, about America. The, the neo-fascists, for obvious reasons, it was uh, the democracy, and this, is not, uh, this was not uh, their project. For the Catholic, America was Protestantist, especially in those years. There was a Protestant, Protestant nation. Do you remember 
um, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who was called by the National Council of Churches before his election, hi, uh, Mr. Candidate, what are you doing with your Catholicity? Uh, will you be loyal to the American Constitution and to the Pope? So uh, the, America, the Catholic audience in Italy had not the categories to understand American democracy and church-state separation model in, in the US. The leftist, of course, as uh, Massimo uh, uh, already expressed, were considering the, uh, the, the class struggle as uh, the key dynamic, and the class was not the king category. It was another one, it was race, but something else, not the classic class, according to the uh, Marxist terminology. So, because of this uh, um, strong polarization, the cultural and political polarization of the Italian audience, it was very difficult, and to me, uh, still today, very difficult for the e Italian audience to understand the um, American uh, political dynamics. In this sense, it's obvious that the Black Panther became very, very popular among some uh, leftist groups. It became, I mean, the strong voice um, with a, a process of over-evaluation of, of their effective power. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, the, even, even Malcolm X was a little bit difficult to be understood for the same reasons, because he was preaching revolution and he was preaching by any means but he was not using the classic uh, Marxist categories. And uh, uh, in Italy, what changed a little bit was the publication by Einaudi of his autobiography. This was a turning point. And I have to say that uh, uh, the few um, texts we can read by, by um, Malcolm X translated into Italian have been edited by some colleagues and scholars, I would say uh, one name only, but there are others, Bruno Cartosio, uh, who published important text by, uh, by Malcolm X uh, with a little and unknown publishing house, Shake Editions, a very radical one, very limited in its capacity to stay in the market. So it is very clear that uh, with the exception of the autobiography, um, Malcolm X is not known to the Italian public. I fully agree that, again, if we don't understand the connection between Malcolm and Martin, we miss a very uh, important piece of the frame. The, the, the important research by uh, James Cohn Martin and Malcolm in America, published by Mary Noll a few years ago, uh, is uh, incredibly important to show how there was a very intriguing and committing creative dialogue among the two leaders. And we cannot go on uh, stating this polarization. Um, they were different, but in some sense, between 74, 64 and and uh, 65 when Malcolm died. And for Martin, until 68, there is a, a new consideration by Martin Luther King about uh, Malcolm X's role and leadership. Um, thank you, Paolo Naso. I, uh, we are um, approaching the end of today's panel discussion. I would just like um, to see if Paolo Naso wants to briefly respond to uh, a, one of the aspects of Matteo Caponi's question. I'm, I'm afraid we are not gonna be able to answer the questions that arrived um, later. And um, he makes a uh, more general point, but he then refers to the process of domestication of Martin Luther King in the US, which happened in the 1980s during Reagan. That we know uh, was a, a Republican conservative president. And so um, if I would close with this question, um, and if I may add something to Paolo Naso. So uh, Paolo, you clearly uh, refer to the domestication that happened in Italy 
at the very, during the years of Martin Luther King, so 50s and 60s. Here, there is a reference to another process of domestication. It was not during King's life, because as you, as you clearly pointed out, King, especially in the late 60s, was perceived, started to be perceived as a radical from, for example, Lyndon Johnson. And so uh, can you say anything about this uh, later process of domestication in the US of Martin Luther King? How does he become from a radical of the latest years? How does, at a certain point, he become uh, domesticated? How do we end up uh, having Reagan incorporating and celebrating King as a common American hero and any even any possible refre- uh, reference if, if you want to make to the Italian, again, the Italian perception of King in those 1980s. Thank you so much. And then we're going to close. Yes, thank you. This is a very crucial question. I think that um, it was a token. It was a token given to, to the Black community and to the activists to say, uh, from the White House side, yes, we are ready to recognize and to honor the hero of the civil rights movement. That is a past history. Now we are in a new era where uh, reconciliation is the is the, the phrase. And uh, think about think about the interpretation by Ronald Reagan about uh, the city upon the hill. A very strong um, uh, image of the American public rhetoric. And for sure, he, he was preaching the Reaganomics as the, the, new, the new message that the city upon the hill was sending to the, uh, to the world. Who was paying the price for the Reaganomics? The black community and the poor. So the recognition and the honorary Martin Luther King was the token given to uh, uh, this other America, I would say, uh, to compensate the uh, conservative radicalization of economics and social policies. In Italy, we have a different, a different story. We have a, a, a sort of uh, opposition because when King died, there was a celebration of the American heroes. So the discovery of uh, that evil racism and uh, the celebration of the new America that started with the cooperation between King and Kennedy. Uh, again, this is a sort of mythology, as I try to express. Now we uh, are more uh, solid in our capacity to analyze what happened in terms of uh, um, policies, uh, international policies. In those years, um, the war was changing a lot of dynamics. So the relation between Kennedy and the world order is uh, less um, uh, easy than it is usually described in Italy. So we had to wait uh, until the 90s for a reconsideration of the King ministry. And I think that the idea that uh, uh, stressing the process of radicalization of the leader, again, is a way to celebrate uh, this uh, gigantic figure that uh, played the role not only in the American society, but also in say, the global society. Uh, thank you so much, um, Paolo Naso and Angelica Pisarini uh, for accepting to participate to um, today's panel discussion. Uh, I would also love uh, to thank all the public who participated from different countries um, again, thank you also to all the staff uh, of Casa Italiana for uh, making sure that the event could run smoothly as it as it uh, was the case. And again, thank you so much for participating today. Uh, uh, should you be, in case you are interested in knowing more about the book, and even in case in purchasing the book, uh, you find below in the chat the uh, precise link to the La Terza website where you can buy. Again, thank you so much and have a very pleasant day. Buonasera. Grazie.